welcome to Behind the Syllabus. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the professor that's been here for 44 years, Roger Dore. We gotta cut this show. Sorry, bro. Side outside. Huh? Parents were Bob and Wilma Dore. Bob Dore came out of Beardstown, Illinois. My mother, Wilma Obermiller, came out of Seward, Nebraska. And I was born in 1945 in Florence, Arizona. Dad was in the service. He was a, a staff sergeant administrator at, a, at an Italian prisoner of war camp in Arizona. The U.S. government had taken it over for Italian POWs that we had captured over in Europe and brought to the United States. My baby clothes were all made out of silk because they took old parachutes. And the POWs made all the baby clothes for my mother. And then in February of 46, Dad was discharged and they moved to uh, Lincoln and then shortly thereafter to Nebraska City. My mom, the tradition was that, that the girls dropped out of school in eighth grade. So she eventually, she got her GED the same year I graduated from high school. But um, she went to Lincoln to a beautician school. I have a sister, Barbara, who was born in 1948. And Barb, she has three boys, my three nephews, and they all live in Gary as well. Elementary school was in Nebraska City. The Second Avenue School, middle school, seventh and eighth grade, was the Nebraska City Junior High. In April 1959, my dad was transferred from Nebraska City to Hastings. And so we spent uh, basically ninth through twelfth grade in Hastings, Hastings Senior High. We graduated from, from the Tiger Den. I had electric trains. I could build my kingdoms. And I really had some very elaborate uh, layouts, I think. Nothing that would win awards, but pretty, pretty darn thorough. I would say then that my hobby was, was listening to baseball on the radio, and it was the St. Louis Cardinals, Camo X out of St. Louis. And you had uh, Harry Carey, Joe Garagiola, and Jack Buck were the announcers. And I, I learned to score games. And I can remember working on my train, scoring the game, while all my new from the big radio. Like, that was it, baby. That and throwing a baseball, I mean, I just, I would throw a, throw a tennis ball against the foundation of our house. My passion for baseball is pretty fulfilling. And I had rheumatic fever at the end of third grade, and I spent that summer flat on my back. I was not allowed to get out of bed for about six weeks, and so you get a heart murmur, and you have very high temperature days on end, and of course you have no energy. But the good news is, by the end of the summer, I'd recovered enough so I could go to school. Very reduced mobility, uh, and that limited my athletic involvements for a couple of years. Finally, they allowed me to resume summer baseball. Never allowed me to play football. I couldn't even get the doctor's permission to be the punter, but I probably could have easily had success. It was an interesting thing because I've really not been ill since. I've worked 46 years, and I've missed four days of work in 46 years. When we return, we'll be talking about Roger Doerr's college life. This is Behind the Syllabus. Welcome back to Behind the Syllabus. Let's take a look at where Roger Doerr decided to go to college. Well, I was probably leaning towards attending Dana College at the time, but my best friend in high school called me one day and said, you know, there's this new football coach at Lincoln, Bob Devaney, and I think there's going to be some exciting football played at Lincoln. Why don't we go to Lincoln? So Mel and I ended up being roommates at the University of Nebraska, and that's how much sophisticated intelligence I gathered in determining where I was going to go to college. I, I went being a, a pre-law um, English history major, but it was the year the University of Nebraska computerized their registration. Somebody hit the wrong key, and I got put in the College of Business Administration instead of Arts and Sciences. And when I went to change colleges at the registrar's window, I was told that they didn't have a procedure designed for that yet, and I was supposed to come back in November. Well, in the meantime, I had courses in business like uh, accounting and economics, and I found that I, I really enjoyed those. I sort of accidentally found myself enjoying accounting, something I didn't know anything about until I accidentally got put into it. But I, I think uh, career-wise, I originally thought if I didn't do the law thing, I, was, I would have uh, ended up teaching English in a high school setting. So I, I don't know if I really could say that I did anything wild and crazy in college. I pretty much played by the book. Um, I worked extremely hard to get the grades I did, graduate with high distinction. 
I was active in many, many activities, vice president of the student body, uh, and, and dozens of other things. I'm being involved in the university debate team, which did a lot of travel. Um, it, it was a pretty, uh, pretty programmed existence. Uh, I went to school without financial resources. I watched every, every nickel, how I spent it. So I suppose the wild and crazy introduction that I had came at the end of my junior year when I was tackled into the Innocent Society. And uh, even though I was not of age, uh, the party that, that took place at the Knolls in Lincoln was, was one I'll perhaps never forget. We did a lot of intramurals, and that would be both football and uh, some basketball. The football was, was flag football, and I have a lot of good memories from that. I think probably the highlight of my athletic experience at the university was during the summer, and I was on a uh, softball team that Tom Osborne was on. He was doing his graduate work and I was taking classes. We ended up on the same softball team one summer. So I graduated in 1967 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and Economics, double major. I had an emphasis in Accounting and I had 30 hours of work in uh, English Lit, which I think was pretty unusual for an Accounting type person, as well as 12 hours in Sociology, which I took all of that in my senior year. So I, I had a really, really full, active uh, undergraduate education. I, I interviewed a number of companies, and, the, and I ended up working for a company in Omaha at the time, Northwestern Bell, which was part of the AT&T system. And the reason I liked that was because they, they had a program where they paid for your graduate program. It allowed me to go to Creighton to get my MBA while working for Northwestern Bell. Worked there about a year and a half, and then I went to a local CPA firm. I had no intention of leaving there. And I was finishing up my MBA, and that's when the opportunity sort of came out of nowhere to teach at Hastings College. When we get back, we're going to be taking a look at Roger Doerr's family life. This is Behind the Sofas. Karen Doerr. We were married on November 23rd, 1979, at the Presbyterian Church of the Cross in Omaha, Nebraska. 30, 33 and a half years. Okay, I was going to say 34 years in November, but 33 and a half. <laughs> in the classrooms <laughs> of Hastings College, of course. She took three classes from me, mm -hmm. accounting, a class called personnel management, mm -hmm. and business law. I was married at the time. We didn't connect until... Oh, three years after I graduated. I was living and working in Omaha, was out at a restaurant with friends of mine for dinner. And I was in Omaha taking the CMA exam and staying where they were having dinner and I was at the same place. I said, hi, how are you? That was in June and then I decided in December to see if she was available for a date on New Year's Eve. It was a very snowy night, that's for sure. So our first date was New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1978. Allison was part of the Operation Baby Lift coming out of Vietnam and got out just before Vietnam fell. She was born in 1974. My first wife and I picked her up in Denver. Allison graduated from Mason's College and is living in Torrance, California with our grandson, Caden. Brendan then was born two years later, and he lived till 1986. And he uh, was unfortunately the victim of, a, of an accident crossing the street. It was a very traumatic time. Uh, he was an avid baseball fanatic, sort of like his, his dad. Played Little League, was very, very successful uh, as a young athlete. So base, Little League baseball commanded a lot of the attention. I did Little League and I also did Pony League so probably for about, for about 10 years. I was living in Bronk Hall as the resident counselor. We were the, the, the dorm parents for Bronk Hall for three years. Yeah, it was, it was really neat. Uh, I probably liked it more than Karen did. Clay Anderson, our astronaut, still calls her mom. He was one of our RAs at the time. We did fun vac family vacations. We went to the Black Hills and you know saw the faces and took a number of trips to Colorado. Roger's sister and her family live in Gary, Nebraska, so we always made a trip to Gary to see the cousins. 
in the summertime, or they, and then they would come this way to see the grandparents and us. So, it's a thrill of a lifetime. The image that you have of, a, of an individual through the media is always, you know, something we consume eagerly in America. And I had my own image of, of Ronald Reagan, and then see what a really sincere person he was, and how friendly he was, and how approachable he was. And he was. He was all those things. And he just had a great time in Hastings, and he made all of us feel like this was something pretty, pretty neat that we had done. And of course, he was here at the invitation and encouragement of Bob Gray, someone who did professional PR work for him. I'm a car nut. Uh, Karen and I have owned way too many cars, <laughs> and uh, I wish I could have kept some of them because like, I really had some, some interesting vehicles over the years. But uh, I've always, I've always enjoyed having a, uh, a fun set of wheels. They've all had a unique role in various parts of my life. And, and the Camaro that I drive now with the, the soft top is, uh, is probably as nice a car as I've ever. I think the train thing, um, it, had, well, it, had, it has to go back to my parents, my dad, uh, because my grandfather was a railroader and uh, spending summers in Lincoln where, where my grandparents lived and hearing the phone ring at 3 or 4 in the morning, he'd be called and he'd have an hour's notice to get to the roundhouse to get on the engine. And his run was typically from Lincoln to Hastings in those years, sometimes to Ravenna, Nebraska. But just being around that environment and reading his union letters, the union news uh, magazines, I was fascinated with, the, uh, with the, the way they portrayed the railroad industry. And of course, that was still in the era of passenger trains. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I went to the University of Nebraska as a student, I didn't have a car, but we have train service from Hastings to Lincoln. And so it would take two hours and 20 minutes because they had stops along the way. But I, I rode to Lincoln on the train, came back to Hastings on the train, and for three years that was my means of transportation from, from home to the, to the university. I started playing golf very young. I grew up in Nebraska City, about four blocks from the public golf course. And I'd go down at night and go through the bushes and find golf balls. And my dad had a very old set of clubs. And I learned how to, to, to come down on the ball and get it elevated very quickly. I can remember spending hours in the backyard seeing how close could I get to that clothesline and still get the ball to go up and over the clothesline. I used to hit golf balls over our house. <laughs> For whatever reason, I never took out the picture window in the living room. <laughs> Should never have happened. I was on the high school golf team. I was never, we had incredible talent in those years. When I came back from the foundation, Phil Dudley was president, and the college had just gone through a series of changing men's golf coach about every other year. And the current graduate assistant helping with men's basketball and was SID, he also had men's golf. Days. You know, we can't do this. We just need somebody to give stability to the program. And they asked if I would do it. I thought I'd been offered the very best opportunity in the world. I always envied the guys who were the men's golf coach at Hastings College. And I found as soon as it was known that I was the golf coach, I had people that wanted to circle around and talk about golf. My whole social life changed. <laughs> so uh, I took over the golf program in 2003. I think the only thing that qualified me was, was uh, recruiting. This put a lot more pressure on me to, to close the sale. When you're just talking to prospective students as a faculty member, closing the sale is not what you consider your responsibility, but as a coach, you, you have to take it to that next level. You know, I've had some excellent teams. I've had teams that are cali caliber-wise, probably should have gone to nationals. We never got there. And that's, you know, that's just the way golf is. Golf is a cruel sport. But I wouldn't trade this year's group for any of them. Uh, just, you know, these kids are working hard, and golf is what it is. So. Lloyd's very well equipped to, to take this program to another level. He's, uh, he's got all kinds of good ideas, and he's working his butt off on the recruiting side of it. Good things are ahead for men's golf. I think they could be a dominant program as soon as next year again. When we return to Behind the Syllabus, Roger Dore gives a look at what he does on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Welcome back to Behind the Syllabus. Let's take a look at what Roger Dore has been up to for the last 44 years here at Hastings College. I was at the age of 23 arriving on the campus of Hastings College as a, as a new business instructor. 
I had two jobs prior to coming to Hastings, both of which I think were very helpful. And, and actually, the, the experience at Northwestern Bell is what probably gave me the incentive to, to even think about teaching. What happened with, with the coming to Hastings, which really wasn't on the horizon, other than I did my high school years in Hastings, my sister's best friend was the daughter of the academic dean of Hastings College. And in the summer of 1969, Hastings College had two departures from the business faculty that were unexpected. And so they had filled one position and they were desperate to find somebody else for the basic business accounting courses that needed to be offered. Well, I was in my final stages of my master's, my MBA at Creighton, uh, and I got the call in June from the dean asking if I would be interested. He heard about me through his daughter, who was my sister. And I said, no, you know, I'm really not interested. I've, I've got um, some experience that I'm appreciating with the CPA business. But it was a very disjointed conversation. My wife and I lived just by the Strategic Air Command off at Air Force Base. And some B-52s were in the neighborhood at the time. And so that phone conversation was very difficult to carry out. So it just so happened we were in Hastings the next weekend. We had come out because my wife's family lived here. And I called to apologize for that conversation and ended up going to the to Dean Langbart's home, and he brought Ralph Lamb, the chair of the business econ department, over to his house. And by the end of Sunday afternoon, they'd convinced me to change careers. My parents thought I was crazy, that I was a job hopper. I'd learned enough, seen enough already, that there were things that I thought I could bring to the, to the classroom and business that would be um, of, of worth, of merit. And there was a school willing to, to sign on, so I finished the master's in, in August, and a few days later, I landed in Hastings and uh, started teaching about the 1st of September, 69. Official position is Professor of Business Administration. And I teach 12 hours each semester, plus the J term. So it's a 27-hour teaching load, which is the fairly standard model across campus. I used to teach primarily accounting. I found that I really enjoyed going beyond that, so I created classes in nonprofit management. Well, that became the impetus for the, the degree that we created, the major in Human Service Administration. People don't realize this, but the college used to teach in the 60s big lecture sections in the chapel, and everybody had lap boards. In one semester, I had 86 students signed up for business law, which I was teaching. And the only place we could do it on campus, the only place we could do it was the chapel. Well, they'd save the old lap boards. <laughs> we, had, we tried to get all the kids in the front one section of the chapel, but you put close to 90 kids in there, that's a pretty good-sized class. 1,546 students have studied beginning accounting with Professor Lee. I've taught it 69 times now. Uh, because particularly in my late 20s, 30s, there were many opportunities to leave. I was reminded regularly that the uh, financial sacrifices that you make in a career like this uh, have to be balanced out in some way. So there was always someone suggesting that I needed to do something different. I had a serious investigation of teaching at what was then Kearney State. Uh, they made a very attractive offer, but I would have had a totally different set of responsibilities and I just didn't think I would like it as well. I think that the thing that I've enjoyed the most is really the advising. It's interesting how this the advising, uh, some of it's very perfunctory, it just happens, but I can, you know, there's so many special things that come out of it when, when students uh, get that job that they didn't think they would get, or they've made a decision to go to graduate school, and that's, that's always a unique kind of a sense of fulfillment and direction that comes into their life. It's just full of great memories. I think the committee work gives you a chance to get to know people across the disciplines. We're small enough yet to develop close friendships with people in the art department, or the English department, or the social department, or psych, or, or, or music, and, and to have the sense that you can move across the entire spectrum of courses in a liberal arts college and, and, and gain from the knowledge and wisdom of these folks and their specialties. What better environment to live in and to be able to be part of it for these many years. Just, just a phenomenal, phenomenal world. Benefit, blessing. I do, I do believe that it's important, at least from my, from my perspective, to break ties. 
there's been opportunities to stay with the golf program, opportunities to stay on as an adjunct professor, and my answer in both cases is no and no. I don't want to be in the way, and I want to do something different. Well, there is a need to relax. Uh, after 44 years here, plus two years prior, and then graduate school and undergraduate, all, um, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to, to take it down a notch for a while. I do have uh, an opportunity to, re to direct a thriller for the Hastings Community Theater. I did a great deal of community theater work earlier in my career, both directing and acting. You know, there's things I can do with Hastings College in a different capacity, perhaps, but I will play a little more golf and I'll certainly do a lot more reading. And they won't be textbooks. I'm not going to be reading textbooks anymore. I think we, we enjoyed our, our time in Omaha when we were doing the Hastings College Foundation, but we really believe the quality of life is higher in this part of Nebraska. The, uh, we've really got wonderful friends here. I think it's going to be fun to take part of, in the college as a non-employee, all the sporting events, theater events, music events. So we've got a lot of cultural opportunities right here in our hometown. Thanks for watching Behind the Syllabus. In next week's episode, we're going to be meeting with the Reverend David McCarthy. Stay classy, Aston's College.